This is the Monday, November 23rd, Thanksgiving week episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. This is the History Author Show. And for this episode, we're going to take you out to dinner. With a side dish of history, of course. Thank you so much for favoriting our iHeartRadio channel, subscribing to us on iTunes, or tracking us down on one of the many other audio outlets you have available to you here in the future. Today's destination is a national landmark, one where you can eat a meal fit for a king, or for overthrowing one. It's the old 76 house in Tapan, New York, 20 minutes north of the George Washington Bridge at the upper tip of Manhattan Island. The building itself predates the American Revolution by over a century, going all the way back to 1686 when the locals called it Maybes, after the tavern-keeping brothers Casparus and Yost Maybe. Today, the old 76 house serves great food, but 240 years ago, it served an active role in the fight for independence. George Washington, commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, rallied his men there, and in 1780, it served as a makeshift prison for Major John Andre, the British spy caught conspiring with America's most infamous traitor, Benedict Arnold. You can learn more about America's oldest tavern at 76house.com, or by following them at facebook.com slash the old 76 house. I have admired this building for as long as I can remember, so it was an honor to meet the current keeper of the revolutionary flame, Robert Norton just before he opened for a Saturday evening dinner rush. As his dedicated staff swirled around us, filling ice buckets, laying out silverware, and answering the phone for reservations in the background, Robert and I bellied up to the bar to talk about the history of the place and the unique dining experience it offers. It was just the two of us, and the staff, and the ghosts of the days when America wasn't a country, just a dream. I'm sitting with Robert Norton, owner and tavern keeper at the old 76 house in Tapan, New York. We're sitting at the bar, the very bar, the very spot where George Washington bent his mighty elbow and took his meal with legends such as the Marquis de Lafayette and Alexander Hamilton. And let me tell you, Robert, no matter how many times I read that practicing this script, I get goosebumps. Literally, (laughs) thank you so much for opening your tavern to us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And it's funny that you mention that because I'm here every day, obviously, for nearly 30 years now. And I walk in the door and sometimes I forget about just how special this place is. What we do today is what folks did 300 years ago in this self-same spot just hospitality for everybody but then you sit down at this very bar and you realize that the founders of our nation sat in this very spot touching this very piece of wood keeps me coming back (laughs) picture the revolutionary era taverns were much more than a place to eat drink enjoy live music you offer all those things today But Daniel Webster called taverns the headquarters of the revolution. And so I wanted you to take us back a little and explain sort of what roles a tavern like this would have played in that era. Webster was referring to like the Green Dragon uh, in specific in that particular quote, which was one of the founding cornerstone spots where early revolutionaries met and formed what's today's America. The 76 house course it was maybe's tavern back in the 16 and 1700s bore witness to a lot of that as well every major participant in the first corps of the continental army used this building for a significant amount of time it's easier to say that than to list the yeah. litany of people that were here it's just amazing i mean lafayette's only house in the colonies was two blocks up the street 
in what later became Camp Shanks, which was the largest staging area of folks who fought in the Second World War. So it's a continuing presence of providing for Americans what this place has always done, which is a comfortable atmosphere and a landing spot. It's very gratifying for me to have spent my entire adult life doing this, actually, to see that it's something that people really come to and have come to really respect and understand in a way that when I first started in this business wasn't so much. It was really an outpost of civilization. It was an oasis. And if you needed to get your mail, there's no national mail carrier. Okay, meet me at Maybe's. That's M-A-B-I-E. Right. And this was a very centrally located town. So you're right at the crossroads, really, of the revolution an establishment that lays claim to be the oldest. You see that a lot, I find. A lot of places seem to have a bunch of qualifiers and whatnot and say that they're the oldest maybe continuously run or the oldest right. cornerstone or they leave out that they're continuously run. <laughs> so document for the listeners how you have this claim to yeah, be the oldest. We're proud to have no asterisks. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, we don't really know the exact year that the tavern was built. We know it was in existence in 1686. We know it would never burnt down. We know it's been this self-same structure. We know that the town fathers of Tapan paid the maybe family for its use uh, as a public gathering spot. And we know that in 1755, the maybe family expanded the building to include two additional rooms and a second floor. It was at that point, just prior to the revolution, that Japan really had a large growth spurt, so to speak, and that's why the Maybe family needed to do this expansion. It also served as the public house for the town of Japan, or the reason why the Japan patent was actually issued, because you needed to have a town centered around a tavern and a place of worship. The Dutch Reformed Church diagonally across the street is the oldest Dutch Reformed Church in America as well. So there was quite a lot of city ship occurring by these Dutch early Dutch colonists. And if you look at an old map, all roads kind of lead to this little corner here. And there were six converging roads, one of which is, of course, King's Highway, which is the equivalent of the Boston Post Road on this side of the river. It runs right across our front door. So... That brought a lot of traffic to the town of Japan as well. Japan itself became a hotbed of kind of revolutionary sentiment. I mean, you have to understand that Japan was settled by the Dutch. The Dutch were naturally predisposed to want to separate themselves from the English. It's no surprise that in July 4th of 1774, the Dutch town fathers of Orangetown gathered in our front dining room and drafted and signed the resolutions of Orangetown, which was a very softly worded but strongly intended document aiming at separating themselves from the English if certain demands were not met. They felt the burden of being mistreated, just as the other colonists did, and because they had no nationality similarity, they of course were one of the first to jump on the bandwagon for the separationist intent. Two full years there, July 4th, 1774. That wasn't you misspeaking. It's two full years to the day. And our founding fathers certainly would have recognized the significance. They, of course, look at the Jefferson and Adams dying of 50 years after July 4th. And they, they saw that very much as being providential. And you think of that right under this roof, that being passed. And you realize it wasn't just one day the colonists decided, hey, we're just going to separate. That was tough to bring that forward. And we'll talk a little bit about just how this meaning of American and being an American came into the popular mind at the time as far as Benedict Arnold, because here's a guy just like Washington grew up a British subject and then feels like he's gotten a raw deal by this sort of bunch of rabble and they're <laughs> turning their backs on him, accusing him of a bunch of things. And he is, or his portrait rather, is one of the centerpieces here, I guess you'd say. Oh, and yeah. it's hanging upside down. So Absolutely. talk about that. The story of Major Andre and Benedict Arnold features prominently here at the 76 house. But the lore behind that watercolor is, and it's a watercolor of Benedict Arnold, the left-hand watercolor is, of course, of Major John Andre, who was essentially doing the king's business. Of course, he freely admitted to spying and was eventually convicted of spying. But the story is, is, is a lot more intriguing than simply a man that was found guilty of spying. Washington saw the picture of 
Benedict Arnold immediately after convincing himself that indeed one of his close friends had been a traitor, had done this treasonous act of trying to allow West Point to fall into British hands. And his immediate reaction was to turn his picture upside down over the fireplace where all his generals were convened. The entire first officer corps of the Continental Army was in the presence of Washington at this time. Of course, turning Benedict Arnold's picture upside down over the fireplace sent a clear and angry message. You ever have somebody straighten it for you? It's, yeah, I absolutely do. <laughs> we, it, it actually has to be screwed to the fireplace wall because we've had so many people do that. Um, but it is the most asked question here at the 76th House for the uh, uninitiated few. And the upside down picture remains there because this was where Washington was when the British spy Major Andre was captured with the plans of West Point. And Major Andre was brought directly to him here at the 76th house. And we locked him up in that little room. You can see over to the right of here behind the green door. And that was the kind of the state room for the town. If you had a lot of money, you got a bunk bed on the second floor with all the other stagecoach passengers. But if you had a lot of social status, this was the room that you were afforded. And he was held in that room. But I think that, you know, you have to understand Benedict Arnold's side of the equation as well. Because I always like to feel a little bit for both sides of the equation. Here's a man who paid for his own officers, beloved of his own army, who was court-martialed by the Continental Congress, essentially because he wasn't a diplomat. And, of course, that didn't sit well with a man of the temperament of Benedict Arnold. Andre, of course, is the sad participant to this story because he's caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. He knows that the result of his being captured is going to be dire. He goes forward anyway and tries to bring the plans of West Point from Benedict Arnold's hands into the hands of the English down in New York and is captured north of Tarrytown and brought here directly to the tavern where he's confronted by the uh, essentially the first corps of the Continental Army who Washington uses as uh, Major Andre's court martial. They all sit in trial of Major Andre. He thought it would be okay because he'd been captured before and there was sort of this gentleman's agreement as an aristocrat. And they imprisoned him at Benjamin Franklin's house when he was caught at one point. That's exactly and right. Yeah. So he would have figured, well, it'd just be upfront and honest. And he wasn't like he was wearing a continental uniform or trying to be <laughs> anybody who was doing anything dishonorable. And so it's something to me that he really was able to go through all this, still have such dignity. He draws a picture of himself when he's imprisoned here at that, what was then maybe his tavern, and, yeah. and really meets his end romantically. And he's a young man at this point, and he's, it's really something, and we'll get into more of that later, but mm -hmm. you told the Journal News that what you enjoy most is catering to the modern American, just like the tavern keepers of the 1600s and 1700s. You mentioned that a little, but I wanted to ask you, since obviously people can't see, what are specific things that you do to sort of bring that experience to life for people? Um, well, that's a that's a great question. First of all, I, I partnered with one of my good friends, Doug Mahal, in the kitchen, who is an exceptional chef, brings the idea of modern American cuisine to the table. We have Rudy and myself. He's been uh, working closely with me for upwards of 20 years now. And we bring in modern music acts after the dining hour. I go to a lot of taverns because it's what I do, it's what I enjoy, it's what I love. And I go to them to see what other tavern keepers' idea of what a great American tavern should be. Because owners place their own identity on the properties that they manage. And they take, I hope, like I do, a certain delight from pleasing the people that come to them. And what I find is is not in keeping with, with what I would like to see or when you go to a, a place uh, that harkens back to the colonial era, you have this kind of false sense of what should be going on there. It's kind of like um, a Disneyland of sorts. Disney does a great job. I'm not putting them down, but it's like waiters and waitresses in period costume, foods that are something that you, you wouldn't normally want to see on your dinner table uh, just because they seem to harken back to what people ate in the 16 and 1700s. A lot of that is false anyway. I mean, a steak is a steak is a steak. They were eating steaks back in the 1600s and they were probably very good. 
So what you want to see on an American dining table changes periodically. Of course, our palates change over time. What we want to see for health reasons or what we want to see as far as our palates change and, and uh, mature or what have you, of course, that all changes. And a good tavern should adjust itself with the times and never forget its past. Never forget its past. And when we get reenactors in here in colonial costume and they're doing their thing, that's a precious moment and it's great. But that doesn't mean we should be having reenactors waiting on people. That's just false. It's meaningless. People want to be waited on by professionals, eat a meal prepared by a professional, and they want to go home with a great dining experience in a place where they can sit up and look at these beams over our head and say, you know what? These beams were a hundred years old before Washington sat here. That's a special experience. Yeah, incredible, yeah. That's a really special and experience. And you would cheapen it if you had people walking exactly. around in polyester be, Martha Washington it's, outfits it's, and distract from it. You don't need that like you right. needed at Disney World because this is really a museum, but it's something where you're not doing a tour guide. And I love that part of it. I love the little touches you have. For instance, the plates. You know, those mm -hmm. plates look like plates. They're pewter, just that you start to sit down at. Those look like plates Washington could have eaten off of. Absolutely. And it's subtle, and it's there, and then, okay, remove it. You bring in the modern plate with your food on it. You don't necessarily want to eat off that or a wooden spoon that Washington might have used. So well, you don't need to have that there. But when you walk in, it invokes enough of it that maybe your brain registers it, but your consciousness doesn't. You see the musket balls on the wall. I mean, those went through my mind there for a minute. It, fortunately, right. not literally, but just figuratively <laughs> went through. My, but you look at those and you think, that was so different from today. Or I looked up at the musket and I said at first to my wife, oh, it's a rifle. And then I corrected myself right. and said, oh, they, they were smooth bore back then. Those are all little things that you absorb when you walk into the old 76 house that remind you of that time that invoke it and the spinning wheel for instance to the left I mean, once you start to consciously look at the things it's really endless so the fact that you have a menu that m maybe has some modern things on it that doesn't detract from it at all because when you're eating you're already enjoying a good meal you're so open to everything around you right that's why washington came here and sat exactly <laughs> yes yeah. you want to have a reason. you want to have a good meal and enjoy it and by the way you said about not giving the litany of all the famous people that came in here some of them are on the menu though so when you come Correct. i'm sure people probably spend the first 20 minutes just looking at the menu and oh wow james gandolfini you know or whoever it is <laughs> that, they, that they happen to recognize at the We've time had, had a and, few local heroes here as yeah, well which is awesome you have yeah. history buffs that i'm sure notice oh my gosh Hey, Washington. Well, Washington is huge, but there's people who love Nathaniel Green. And there's, mm -hmm. in fact, in uh, Englewood, New Jersey, sometimes when I take the 20 bus to the Port Authority, the 20 goes right from here, as a matter of fact, to show right. you all the we roads are, are. We are still the coach stop yeah. for down at Japan. Yeah. I love, but I love that. I love mm -hmm. that. And everybody said, well, wouldn't you want the bus stop moved down the street? And I'm like, no, we are the coach stop. We've always been. That's what this place is. Yes, absolutely. Don't move it. Keep it right here. Yeah, but you are the oldest tavern in America. What a, do you want the buses pulling up in front? Absolutely. Because that's what this place was meant to do and still does. Well, you know, I go outside with a pot of coffee every morning and here you go. Because this is a small community and thankfully, you know, we have a large following. And, and that's what it's all about. Yeah. The point that I was going to interject there, not to take you away from it, but I'm wondering if you know this, the 20 bus that we were talking about, the reason I brought it up many times when I used to take it to Creskill, I wanted to stay on the 20 and go to the old 76 house on my <laughs> way home. But usually I was coming like you. Uh, I occasionally go to a tavern, not for business necessarily. But <laughs> when you take that local 20 that goes all the way down, like you said, the, the King's Road and you go through it's Leonia there now, but there's a little tiny, not a state historical plaque, but a little brown historic plaque. And it says that was Nathaniel Green's tavern. And it go, that bus will take you right from right here from to Washington's there. to there. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is no longer standing. It's now a, a bunch of condos, but I always do look at it when I see it and say, well, mm. I think back to what it would have been like. And I'm able to come here and see this. It was probably very much like this old, what colonial Dutch style that was Absolute, built, you know, those were, th those were really pieces of the revolutionary era that you want more than a plaque. Although you do have a, 
historic blackout front, which is great. Yeah, that's so. true. <laughs> you raise a good point, though, you know, with the missing tavern where that plaque still stands. Just the pressure to not preserve these old, old buildings is very substantial. Yeah, it bears heavy on owners. Just down the street here, when I was a young man, there was a was another tavern of the same vintage as this, a little younger, the 1760s, but still a great old American tavern, and wasn't doing so well. And they ended up tearing it down and building three houses in the space. Yeah. So it's yeah, very it's important that people understand that history and preservation are things that go hand in hand. And you know, everybody has to understand that once it's gone, it doesn't come back. And the story of America, yes, it's in its people, but it's also in the very few edifices that still remain. And there are very few of these old buildings that are being properly maintained. And I wanted to ask you about that very thing, because I was thinking of myself. As I said, I used to work at a animal hospital not far from here, close to animal hospital way back I know. before well. I started doing this. <laughs> and one of the things I would do on my lunch hour, if I was just wanted to get out of the well, let's say smell some fresh air, maybe. Uh, I would just drive around. And one of the places I like to drive by was here, not only for the old 76 house, but just because you have so much the here that's historic. And I wanted to ask you how you came to discover the old 76 house and decided you not only wanted to purchase it, but that you wanted to restore it to its historic glory. Because you're not from right here in Japan, are no, you? No, no. I grew up in lower Manhattan and parts of Queens. And, of course, my dad was a, a very well-known and respected restaurateur in the city. For generations, our family operated Francis Tavern in lower Manhattan, one of the famous old taverns in all of America as well. It was built as a home for the Delancey family in 1763 and later became a tavern when Samuel Francis, who was Washington's chief provisioner, actually took it over. And that's a great story of a tavern because on the second and third floors was like the first State Department, which they called the Department of War, and then the Treasury, uh, Hamilton's office. was, uh, And then there was uh, the whole, basically the whole government uh, when New York was the capital all happened in this, <laughs> in this tavern, basically, which I think is really neat because that's what a tavern's job is. You know, it's kind of neat that way. So how did we come up here or how did I come up here? Um, my dad, having had this experience with several restaurants in Manhattan, but most specifically Francis Tavern, got wind of this property up here that was in much need of restoration. So he came up here with a few of his friends and myself. <laughs> and I'll never forget, we drove up here from Manhattan and there's a gas station in walking distance just down the corner here on the right where I go once a week to fill my car up and uh we asked where tappan was we're looking for the town of tappan and the guy shook his head and says i've never heard of the town of tappan so we're like really we're looking for this restaurant and he's like oh the 77 of course famous place just down the street and so we kind of turned around and came this way and we're looking at each other like what what was up with that well of course everybody pronounces it tapan because it's tapan period that's what it is um, we, we still to this day you know, we always laugh about that as a kind of a funny like we would have never found that place if that guy yeah you're <laughs> yeah, lucky you weren't looking exactly. just for an applebee's or so something were... <laughs> luckily you're looking for a historic no, no, place never heard yeah. it never heard a tappan ever yeah. so. and yet it's the tappan z right, everybody pronounces like the tappan z yeah. bridge so yeah. we're being from uneducated manhattanites we had no idea that it was and when you walked in here the first time i oh my word <laughs> shudder to think shag carpet and you said <laughs> green shag carpet i think it was moving at the time oh, um and uh, they had a drop ceiling so all of these gorgeous beams were covered the walls were covered with tchotchkes things that were bad reproductions of bad american folk art you know, well, they weren't like, you know, it was like, like a motel. It was weird. Yeah, it was weird. Like, you know, uh, pieces of pine with stuff painted on them. And they had, like we do, we, we know we still have a lot of the armaments that were used through the evolution of the American military. They're kind of hanging around here, which is important because it's a big part of the story of the 76 house. So they did have a little bit of that going on. But it wasn't like you walked in and said, wow, this is a great American tavern. You needed to do a little digging, literally, to, to find it. And we moved almost 90 yards of wet red clay out of the basement of this building just to secure the foundation. And two foot increments, uh, your friend Peter Watson, myself, we had 
we're right out of school, basically, and uh, we dug uh, a lot of that just by hand. Moved these large amounts of wet clay by hand in a wheelbarrow out the one little door in the basement. We filled three 30-yard dumpsters with this wet clay and then poured a rebar reinforced hydrostatic foundation underneath this uh, 1600s portion of the building. So hopefully it won't settle any further. We I've been here another 20 years, yeah. 25 years now, hasn't moved too much. But I mean, if you look, the beams from one ceiling to the other are over a foot off. The mantle, however, was built with that large brick arch underneath and that did not shift. So the mantle shows your horizontal line and your beams can actually show just how much that front wall settled over that large amount of time. In fact, there was a period, and there's a picture of the center section where the front door is, where a large section of the um, sandstone kind of fell out in the street while people were still in the building. And they <laughs> got they gathered up the wow. you know it looked desolate because Japan had fallen on bad times. They moved the capital from Japan to Goshen. Uh, the capital of Orange County is now Goshen, and they built the new city, which they never named anything other than the new yeah, city. That's kind of weird. <laughs> weird. So Japan was no longer the capital, and during that time, uh, the town did have a little slump, but there were still people living in the building, and they literally like popped the stones back and mortared it all back together. And thankfully, they did a damn good job because here it is another hundred years later after that, you know, and then our work, I think, has really stabilized the structure so that there's no need for anybody to worry for a while. And it's odd also, the oldest section of the restaurant, the 16 and 1700 portions of the restaurant, they need far less maintenance than the 1972 uh, kitchen edition huh. that they put on. So, yeah, that's pretty funny. It looks like it stood forever when yeah. you look at it from the outside, and it doesn't look like it's going to be pushed down no. anytime soon. You got it's that one, one twisty fireplace that makes me nervous. Every time I have a mason <laughs> go up there, like, this isn't going anywhere. So I'm like, okay, good. It's just a little weathered, I guess. Like sometimes when you, you meet an old gentleman, you think, oh, gosh. And he shakes your hand and yeah, you think, like, oh, my, you feel like your fingers, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a weak <laughs> loser. Like, well, he spent his life in something like fighting in the revolution yeah. or something like working on the farm or something like that. And that's kind of like this building because it wouldn't have endured through fires and depressions and wars and all kinds of things and there's a creek right near here which i don't know if played a role in clay oh, yeah. ending up in the basement but that's gonna flood sometime in 265 years or whatever so, yep. yeah. actually that was navigable to the hudson river wow i mean now it's it's a, it's a good sized little stream you would call it but you could bring a barge in back wow. in the day that's how much it's silted up and the maybes who were the original tavern keepers were also merchants so that's why this was a very good spot for them to build because it's high ground but the stream is just below us and so they could unload these barges and take dry goods off them and actually store them in the building next door which is pretty cool you say your goal is preservation not just restoration which i like because it's not as if as you said, you just set the place up and then you make it a museum piece and maybe like they put those plexiglass windows over things sometimes and maybe you took the place in the bar where Washington sat, the bar rail and said, well, we're going to put this in a loose side case or something like that. You really want people to be able to enjoy the experience of sitting here and preserve it for future generations, not just restore it and then sort of encase it in a safe somewhere and say, we're never going to touch it again. And I love that feeling of, hey, this is a place you come, but you can sit in that chair. It doesn't, everything doesn't look like and feel like it is a museum piece at all. And then I thought of the rules that we all live by now, which wouldn't have been the case when they built it. And I thought, were there ever any conflicts when you wanted to restore things that you had to put in? For instance, I'm sure in the kitchen and here in the restaurant, you have to obey fire codes now. Oh, and that. Very true. And what were the conflicts there? I have to say that, and I'm proud of my father and his partners for persevering through a few of the machinations that we had to kind of go with. One of those is this building, though you wouldn't see it, is entirely sprinkled against fire and so on. And doing that so that the naked eye doesn't see it is very difficult. And in between each of these beams, and they're only about two feet apart, not even, is a sprinkler head, a little concealer head, which you can barely see. Yeah, if I look up, it's one stand. over your head. Now that you now I point it out, you can yeah. see them. But all of that, all of that machinery has to be on the second floor. 
So not only was that a lot of work, obviously a lot of cost. And the intent of the crew when they first came up here was really to get an operating restaurant going. So the investors and their partners, and indeed hopefully myself to some degree, though I'm probably least responsible because I'm I was just the germ of the idea rather than the participant with the dollars and cents. You know, uh, this was a big responsibility that they undertook, and pulling it off so successfully, yeah, I'll take a little credit for that, but only because they helped me do that. It's enormous. Now we have. HVAC and a full fire suppression system in both the front and the back of the house that's really exceptional. But you need that because you can't replace this building. Every year when I go to renew my uh, insurance <laughs> with uh, Utica Fire or whoever it is today, yeah. <laughs> um, you know they're like, ah, how are we going to replace this if something happens? And A, nothing's going to happen. And B, we have enough security in place that any catastrophe should be able to shunt it. You know, shouldn't really be a catastrophe so yeah those make sense to have put those in even if it wasn't something right. you were required to do by law you, right. you'd want to be able to make sure that you don't have somebody throw down a cigarette or you have candles for instance again that's right. not specific to the restaurant here but you do have it in the sort right. of easily knocked over <laughs> of the period there's a reason a lot of these buildings aren't around anymore that's but that exactly could be right. knocked over and so you want to fact, make let me, sure. Let me correct. We don't have candles. We have the little oil lanterns that just that oh. extinguish themselves oh, immediately. So <laughs> you're thinking just always. because I'm thinking of that. Yeah. But see now, that's so mm-hmm. I don't have to think. Of it, right? <laughs> exactly. When I come in, I just see an oil lamp. You see a candle as a diner. It's yeah. Perfect. That's what yeah. you want to see. Yeah, absolutely. So you take something. You're not going to count on testing that. I'm not going to test system, that. No, so. Not in front of you either. <laughs> <laughs> My guest is Robert Norden, proprietor of America's oldest tavern, the 76 House in Japan, New York. It's a national landmark, is it not? And a place where the indispensable man, George Washington, rallied his generals to victory and imprisoned a British spy. When you stop in for a meal, be sure to visit Washington's headquarters, the DeWint House, just across Spark Hill Creek, which we were just talking about. And to learn about this living monument to the Revolutionary War, find out about enjoying a meal here, visit 76house.com, that's the number 76 and house, or facebook.com slash the old 76 house. Now, Robert, I wanted to get to the tavern's role in that most infamous spy story in American history, the Major John Andre and Benedict Arnold conspiracy to surrender West Point, weaken the defenses, And I wanted to focus on the personal aspect because you picture Washington, he's here in a tavern, he's relaxing, I guess you might say, as much as you could when you're in the middle of fighting a war, but it's a place he felt safe and comfortable, and Arnold was somebody he felt safe and comfortable with. There's no equal to George Washington, but I would suppose Arnold, having been this hero of Saratoga, he was somebody Washington could sit with at this bar and probably would have been one of the last guys to fall out with him and a confidant and a friend. What do you think his feeling was when they walked in here and told Washington this Andre, we have him here and we think he's a conspirator and this is the guy of all people that he's conspiring with? Well, yeah, I mean, when Major John Andre was indeed marched in through the front door, he was marched in that door and then locked up uh, in the room behind us over on the left, his guilt was pretty much already known. I think that Washington, who was at the 76 house, but then left to go to the DeWint house, which is where he quartered three, four houses down the block here, he had no will to meet with Major John Andre. In fact, during the uh, trial and eventual execution of Major Andre, General Washington had the windows of the DeWint House property shuttered so that he was uh, on some level immune to the machinations going on by his order to execute Major Andre for spying. Now, he didn't do that capriciously. Major John Andre was well-liked by Washington, very well-liked by Alexander Hamilton. In fact, the execution of Major Andre forever disturbed the relationship between Alexander Hamilton and Washington. Hamilton, by the way, was living on the second floor of this tavern while Major Andre was sleeping in the room underneath him, waiting for his execution. Talmadge right outside the door where Nathaniel Green set up his headquarters. They only had five guards on Major Andre, and none of them were allowed in the building. They had one on each corner of the building and a fifth guard to walk around and make sure the other four didn't fall asleep. 
And while Major Andre was here in the tavern, he continued to write prolifically. He finished writing a play. He did some charcoal drawings. He entertained some lady visitors. So these are not the actions of a man who necessarily feels he may be condemned to death. This is also the actions of a man who twice before had been caught spying and was kind of released on his own recognizance. So you, you have this unusual play. But now this is October of 1780, and Washington himself needs to change the scope of the War of Independence, a war really defined by economics. And now he takes this man who freely admits to spying, but is an aristocrat, and as aristocrat is being treated differently. If this was a commoner who had been caught spying, he would have been summarily executed and executed as a commoner, which is by hanging. And so after Washington convenes his first officer corps, they have a court-martial for Major John Andre, where Andre freely admits to spying, he orders Andre's execution. And what's important about that is this becomes the first aristocrat executed by colonists, directly by Washington's order. They march him up the hill behind the restaurant, and they execute him by hanging, which undermines the whole social structure of the colonies in a way that we as contemporary Americans have a hard time understanding. For instance, if you're a farmer in the hills behind Japan, you care little for the price of goods from England or abroad or whatever taxes are going on in the cities because you're really concerned with your own personal liberty and providing for your family through the winter. And now Washington is taking this aristocrat and treating him as a commoner. He's facing the same censure, the same punishments that a normal person would be having committed the same crimes. And so now suddenly the Revolutionary War has a different complexion to you because you left wherever you came from for a life where you would be treated in a specific fashion, less, uh, less of a class society, for instance, particularly in this area where these free men are going about their business and they want to be treated as such. Now the war makes a lot more sense to you. And, of course, three years later, we have Sir Guy Carlton and Washington sitting on that table just behind you where Sir Guy Carlton's handing Washington the plans of the British evacuation and declaring America free and independent of Great Britain. I mean, that's our real Independence Day right here, right behind yeah, you. they all leave. That's yeah. like something. <laughs> and they fire a salute from a sloop of war. That's, that's right. Just, the what a world, right? Yeah. yeah like it's a, as you said, this idea of the honor between foes really did play a big role. And I was trying to think of a way that we might relate to it. I guess maybe the closest would be when you have, say, uh, an impeachment, you know, well, R Richard Nixon, perhaps, or more recently we had President Clinton and he was potentially going to have to go stand in the well of the Senate. That was one thing that Nixon said at the time, we can't have a president ever do that. And he would have had to have done it if they'd, if they'd done a full censure. Although Andrew Johnson, when he was impeached, he didn't, he just stayed in the White House and waited to hear, had some poor kid running back and forth to bring him messages. But it, it was really the foundation of a lot of those wheels and actions that Washington set in motion to bring this Major John Andre, who really just sort of bungled into Patriot hands and just take him and say, hey, we're going to treat you exactly like everyone else, not give you a little bit of warm brandy and a violin and tell you to just hang out with Benjamin Franklin as he had when caught before with this sort of thing. And, you know, he was really treated just like anyone else, as you said. I mean, he had nicer accommodations, obviously. He was here at the 76 house. But the idea of how he is remembered by a contemporary American like yourself and at the time, that's fascinating to me because we still have a little bit of a a soft spot for him, like Hamilton would. He was held in this great esteem by Americans then and now, certainly more so than a guy like Arnold was. And at the time, the day of the execution, it's high noon, October 2nd, 1780, a crowd of 1,500, which seems to me to be pretty significant considering what the population would have been around here at the time. They gathered to witness this execution, as you said, on the hilltop behind this very tavern. Here's an eyewitness account of Major Andre's final hours, written by Dr. James Thatcher, a surgeon in the American Revolutionary Army. The reading is by Joseph Reed of our History Author Show. Major Andre is no more among the living. I have just witnessed his exit. It was a tragical scene of the deepest interest. 
During his confinement and trial, he exhibited those proud and elevated sensibilities which designate greatness and dignity of mind. Not a murmur or a sigh ever escaped him, and the civilities and attentions bestowed on him were politely acknowledged. Having left a mother and two sisters in England, he was heard to mention them in terms of the tenderest affection, and in his letter to Sir Henry Clinton, he recommended them to his particular attention. The principal guard officer, who was constantly in the room with the prisoner, relates that when the hour of execution was announced to him in the morning, he received it without emotion, and while all present were affected with silent gloom, he retained a firm countenance with calmness and composure of mind. Observing his servant enter the room in tears, he exclaimed, Leave me till you can show yourself more manly. His breakfast being sent to him from the table of General Washington, which had been done every day of his confinement, he partook of it as usual, and having shaved and dressed himself, he placed his hat upon the table and cheerfully said to the guard officers, I am ready at any moment, gentlemen, to wait on you. The fatal hour having arrived, a large detachment of troops was paraded, and an immense concourse of people assembled. Almost all our general and field officers, excepting His Excellency and staff, were present on horseback. Melancholy and gloom pervaded all ranks, and the scene was affectingly awful. I was so near during the solemn march to the fatal spot as to observe every movement, and participate in every emotion which the melancholy scene was calculated to produce. Major André walked from the stone house in which he had been confined between two of our subaltern officers, arm in arm. The eyes of the immense multitude were fixed on him, who, rising superior to the fears of death, appeared as if conscious of the dignified deportment which he displayed. He betrayed no want of fortitude, but retained a complacent smile on his countenance, and politely bowed to several gentlemen whom he knew, which was respectfully returned. It was his earnest desire to be shot, as being the mode of death most conformable to the feelings of a military man, and he had indulged the hope that his request would be granted. At the moment, therefore, when suddenly he came in view of the gallows, he involuntarily started backward and made a pause. "'Why this emotion, sir?' said an officer by his side. Instantly recovering his composure, he said, "'I am reconciled to my death, but I detest the mode.' While waiting and standing near the gallows, I observed some degree of trepidation, placing his foot on a stone and rolling it over and choking in his throat, as if attempting to swallow. So soon, however, as he perceived that things were in readiness, he stepped quickly into the wagon, and at this moment he appeared to shrink. But instantly elevating his head with firmness, he said, It will be but a momentary pang. And taking from his pocket two white handkerchiefs, the provost marshal, with one, loosely pinioned his arms, and with the other, the victim, bandaged his own eyes with perfect firmness, which melted the hearts and moistened the cheeks not only of his servant, but of the throng of spectators. The rope being appended to the gallows, he slipped the noose over his head and adjusted it to his neck, without the assistance of the awkward executioner. Colonel Scamell now informed him that he had an opportunity to speak if he desired it. He raised the handkerchief from his eyes and said, I pray you to bear me witness that I meet my fate like a brave man. The wagon being now removed from under him, he was suspended and instantly expired. It proved indeed but a momentary pang. He was dressed in his royal regimentals and boots, and his remains in the same dress were placed in an ordinary coffin, and interred at the foot of the gallows, and the spot was consecrated by the tears of thousands. Dr. Thatcher's account shows how this feeling was about Major Andre. He's held in high esteem, as you said, by men of unquestioned patriotism like Alexander Hamilton. And meanwhile, Benedict Arnold, his name isn't even written anywhere in stone. He, as I said, hero of Saratoga, there's just his boot there and exactly. that's it. No just name. Yeah. And they went and they erased his name from gravestones. He wasn't dead at the time. Just anybody in his family that had been named Benedict Arnold, they chiseled it off the cemetery stones. Man, those revolutionary folks really knew how to hold a grudge. And yet here's Andre, who he has a monument up there 
on the hill on the spot although a couple of people tried to blow it up because they felt that it was disrespectful <laughs> to washington still that stands there and do you get people in here who say well gosh that andre that was a romantic story i want to sit in his jail cell or i want to but you probably don't get anybody who says where do you think benedict arnold sat or it's something, isn't That's it? That's true. He's yeah. so long. Well, there's, he, there's no forgiving and forgetting for Benedict Arnold. No, I mean, there is a very small, and when I say very small, there, there's always somebody who wants to raise the case that Benedict Arnold was too smart a general to have a plan as simple as this, and that he probably had something larger afoot. And if you want to cast Benedict Arnold in any kind of great light, you have to remember that every man who served under him really regarded him as a special force. And if there was some kind of end run, you know, maybe he had intended for the English to believe him that he was sending his men away on a fool's errand and that he was going to uh, replace the chain with a link of cotton so they could cut it easily and take command of West Point. Maybe at the day that was all supposed to happen, he had something very different planned for the English, and this would have been his great coup de grace and his way to be re-ingratiated with the Continental Congress and indeed have his fortune restored and so on. But for one person that believes in that, there's uh, a million that don't. <laughs> so, yeah, I think pretty, I'm on the side of the million. Yeah, it seemed pretty clear <laughs> at the time. And we talked a little bit about the restoration that you did. Mm -hmm. There was a room falsely billed as Andre's jail. When oh, you my gosh. Place, yeah. Right? Well, that yeah. was a you have to remember that taverns grow and change with their times. And during World War Two, Japan became very a very unusual place. It was populated by the largest group of people that fought in the Second World War. Camp Shanks was a block up the street. And uh, there's a, still a little museum, a Camp Shanks yeah. Museum, and a whole community that's built on the old military property. But most of the folks that went overseas on the Liberty ships departed from what we now call Piermont, and they built a pier to receive these ships, obviously. And they were all quartered up the street. And, of course, the kind of romantic military ideal ran high, so they built what they called a commemorative room, which was a little fake jail cell and they had like a desk that they cut in half and threw a English red coat costume over and left a couple of old muskets in the corner and that was supposed to be Andre's prison. Well, of course he wasn't held there. The accounts of Major Andre and the relative luxury in which he were kept are well documented but this became kind of like the only thorn in my side after we did our restoration work because people grew up as young adults and so on, seeing this little ramshackle room, and they came to believe that this was the actual room where Major Andre was held in, and only part of that area was used, obviously. So when it was removed, because it had to be, because what we were doing was an actual preservation effort, something that was going to bring this tavern back to where it was at the time when Major Andre was imprisoned here, a lot of people felt that we were going in the opposite direction took literally two decades to finally convince everybody I I personally felt I needed to convince that we did the right thing. And we were talking about good customers that were like, this is the best steak I've ever had, but I can't believe you <laughs> took that darn room out. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's all right, so okay, mind, next, you know, yeah. next week when you come for that steak, I'll change your mind again. <laughs> yeah. There's people hold on to a lot of those myths. Oh, it's really funny. I, I interviewed yeah. Charles Learson, who wrote Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty, and he said he went into it as a journalist trying to research. He thought he would find a lot more terrible stories about Ty Cobb because he has this terrible reputation. And he said, I did half a day's research, and I found it baseless. It was a real hatchet job. And he said, people here, there's a new Ty Cobb bio, he said, and there there was real consternation with some people because they got these stories from their fathers when they were sitting at a game. Of Ty Cobb killed three men. It's like, well, he didn't kill anybody. <laughs> like, he was right. a fighter, but he wasn't. And he said, so there's a reluctance right. to give up on those stories. And for me, I always try to say, if I find out I'm wrong about something, if I've been informed wrong, it's not my fault. It's right. not, not your fault. They, if somebody brought you here as a kid and said, that's Andre's jail, well, okay. No. But I'd rather know the real story than just the fake part of it. One thing about Andre, though, that I did want to ask, his remains were exhumed from uh, this little circle up the street. Correct. But I read something, and I wanted to know if it's true or if it's America's first urban legend, since we we're talking about truth. I read that he 
left, so to speak, his big toe bones here. Is that <laughs> true or not, is that Not false? by his choice. <laughs> oh, gosh. I first came up here in the 80s, right? I was a young man, freshly minted out of school. We had just finished our preservation efforts here. And on the mantle in the large room where we have that enormous fireplace, we could actually roast a lamb in, I think. That just because I'm mantle. Greek. You said that just because I'm Greek. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> just assume no comment. I was... No comment. No <laughs> comment. Um, but there was a little snuff box, and everybody was in awe of this little snuff box. And being kind of a naturally curious person, I kind of go to the head. It was a big meeting for a merging of the historical societies of the area. First time they held a group meeting with everybody, and it was an event for them that I didn't know the importance of at the time. But yeah, it's rare that we get more than one historical group all dining together. They all like to do their own thing. And here, where else would you have such a gathering than at the reopening of this great American tavern? And so they came here and getting back to the snuff box, I'm like, well, what is up with the snuff box? Oh, careful, careful. Open it carefully. I open it. It looks like there's a cigar butt in this little snuff box. I'm like, okay, put, put it back together. I put it back together. I'm like, that, that's Major Andre's toe. Okay. Now, I've heard this story told many, many times. And after the war of British aggression, which everybody forgets about, there were reparations by the English to the Americans. And one of those kind of olive branches was that America was going to give back to the English the remains of Major John Andre, who's a hero in England. And he's now buried in a very elaborate tomb in London, England, in Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey. It's a gorgeous tomb. I have actually visited it. And the story goes that the English didn't go to the highest bidder for the exhumation of Major John Andre. And while they very well documented how he was exhumed and the various things that had gone on during the interim long period of time that he was in the ground, one of the things is you have to understand is as well liked as Major Andre was, he was still an Englishman. And in this area, there was the Baylor Massacre, where the English bayoneted all the free men in front of their families at 12 o'clock at night at the end of Old Tapan Road here. So there was a lot of hatred for the English, whether you were a bon vivant, well-lettered man like Major Andre, or you were some cutthroat, you were still wearing a red coat, you were not liked. So when he was buried, the group of people who still had this animosity for the English, which was the majority of folks actually, threw peach pits in the grave. You know, these trees would grow and his remains would be uh, destroyed in the process, right? And some of that was uncovered when they exhumed Major Andre. But as he was kind of carted off and kept down the street in a mortuary, it's also rumored that his big toe was taken and put in this snuff box and it's because they always wanted a piece of Major Andre here back in Japan. Now, whether that's a true story or not, I am unwilling to guess that. But I've heard it from quite a few people who like to tell that tale. But if you ask where the toe is, it seems to be a mystery to one and all. So maybe there's a secret society that's uh, the <laughs> keeper of the toe or something like that. But uh, certainly it gives pause. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like a strange thing to have. I, I, we were talking about the health department. It seems like, it's like well, well, I think the severed it's not toe. going in anybody's yeah. salad. <laughs> uh, now, that would be a good thing to find in the salad. No, I don't think so. Go, I guess, you know, for the history, history oh, minded, some word. of these folks, right? Okay, time may stand still at the old 76 house, but eventually you have to signal for the check. And I'm looking forward to having a beer like Washington at the bar here, which I can't do while we're recording. So let me ask you one final question. And I think it's a little bit of a cliched question, but I, I bet it crosses your mind from time to time. If you could sit at the bar with General Washington and get the courage up to address him, because I'm sure guys like us, he'd probably look at us, what we're wearing and kind of a little... Uh, doughy in the middle if you don't mind me saying the two of us <laughs> you know right. we, we live in the soft modern life what would you say to him say to washington oh, the founder of the country uh, remarkable man dear lord what would you say to washington that's an unfair question <laughs> that's just i 
you know, I, I think there's so many remarkable things that he did. One of the grandest gestures, but it's not a question. I mean, but what what sticks with me to Washington is not even the fact that he was one of the reasons why we won the American Revolution. It's when this man was, he could have been king of the country. When he walked away, when he put his saber on the table and walked away. It's one of the one of the, the few gestures in politics that are not political. And and I believe that people that want to be in American government should look at that gesture and carry it with them into office because it's putting down the saber after you've served one term and walking away because you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for the country. Politics should not be a career. Once politics becomes career, that's the downfall of America. And if I had something to say to Washington, it would be thank you for that gesture. That's a great thing to leave it on, that we say, come here to the old 76 house and get some of that revolutionary era spirit in ourselves and think about things like liberty and how we preserve that in the nation as a whole, just as you've done here at the 76 house. So. Thank you so much, oh, Robert Norton, for having me. the man who preserved the revolutionary past for all of us to come and enjoy a beer in the presence of. I really appreciate you joining me and for offering history lovers a dining experience they really can't get anywhere else in this century. Thank you. I hope you have the opportunity to visit the old 76 house and enjoy a meal in the style of George Washington, or at least in his surroundings. You can read more about the tavern at 76house.com or plan a visit for their brunch, music events, and other offerings at facebook.com slash the old 76 house. My thanks to Robert Norton for joining us and for sharing the legacy of the Maybe Brothers, Major Andre, and so many other people, even the Sopranos. You may remember the episode when Tony takes Meadow up to college. Well, the scenes for the restaurant supposedly in Maine were shot at the old 76 house. And I find it interesting that in that episode, Tony tracks down a traitor. Hmm. Oh, and a word of appreciation for Nicole, who waited on us and helped us make the hard choices of which great item to choose off the 76 house menu. Let us know what you think of the tavern and of the interview on Twitter at History Dean or at facebook.com slash history author. And thank you for clicking through our Amazon banner at historyauthor.com. We get a Continental every time you do. Well, now that we're full, I guess we're probably ready for a nap. I hope you'll join us next time for another trip into the past here on iHeartRadio. And remember, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please rate us and leave us a review. We'd sure appreciate it. That's it for this delicious installment of the History Author Show. So until next Monday morning, thanks for listening, and happy reading and eating. Happy reading and eating.